It's difficult to judge the distance to a point of light with just our eyes. So it is with the stars. When we look up on a clear night, it can appear as though all the stars are equally distant from us. That's what many ancient astronomers once thought. They saw the stars as residing on a single great sphere called the celestial sphere. And at the center of the sphere was none other than planet Earth. Bright stars close together were imagined to be the skeletal shapes of great beings or important objects. Such a grouping of stars we call a constellation. Here's the constellation Orion, the hunter. We know today, however, that the stars within Orion reside at very different distances. Farthest out is Anulum, the middle star of Orion's belt. The closest star within Orion is Bellatrix. Let's look at this again. The brightest star is Betelgeuse. As we'll discuss later, Betelgeuse is a supergiant red star close to the end of its lifespan. It could go supernova at any time within the next several million years. And way out here is the Orion Nebula, which we talked about in an earlier lesson. Recall, the Orion Nebula is not a star, but an intense breeding ground for many new stars. So, while all the heavenly bodies might look close together to us, they are in fact spaced quite far apart. So, having you memorize all the various constellations would be a rather Earth-centric homework assignment now, wouldn't it? I don't mean to take the fun out of the constellations. Knowing them has cultural value. And knowing them can also help you navigate your way around the world. So, here are some of the constellations appearing along the ecliptic, which you know to be the plane of Earth's orbit. We call these the zodiac constellations. As Earth revolves over the course of a year, we get to see different parts of the universe in our nighttime sky. This is an outside view of what's going on. What's perspective look like from here on Earth? Well, over the course of a year, we see a parade of constellations. And this parade is heading west. Why? Well, because we revolve around the sun in a counterclockwise fashion, which means we head toward the east. Pretend you're on a carousel. You're moving forward, right? Notice that all the people waiting in line are moving backward. So people standing outside are moving in a direction opposite your own motion from your point of view. Likewise, we're heading toward the east, so the stars, over the course of a year, keep shifting toward the west. Look up at about the same time each night. At midnight on September 1st, you'll see Leo, while at midnight on October 1st, you'll see Virgo. After a whole year, the parade starts over again. So, as the earth revolves around the sun, the nighttime side of earth gets to see different parts of the universe. That's why the stars in the winter sky look totally different from the stars in the summer sky. Okay, so that's the motion of the stars due to our revolution around the sun. What about the motion due to Earth's spin on its axis? Just as we revolve in a counterclockwise fashion, we also spin in a counterclockwise fashion. This is to say, we spin toward the east. And because of that, the celestial bodies appear to be moving to the west in a 24-hour cycle. That's how long it takes for the earth to spin once. This daily east-to-west motion of celestial bodies we call diurnal motion, which becomes most apparent within time-lapse photographs. Right along our axis of rotation, northward, lies the star Polaris, commonly known as the North Star. Have you ever seen the South Star? Nope. There is no bright enough star aligned with the Earth's axis of rotation southward, as you can see in this time-lapse photo from the Southern Hemisphere. So, there are at least two types of motion relative to stars. One, the apparent motion of stars due to our revolution around the sun, and two, diurnal motion due to Earth's spin. Both are happening all the time, 
It's only the diurnal motion that you're going to notice over the course of a single evening. Revolutionary motion is more subtle, but it explains why Orion might rise at 9 o'clock one night, but next week it rises at 8.30. There are actually a number of other ways in which stars appear to move through our night sky, and there's also the eastward motion of our moon. Let's move into those types of motion in the next lesson. Good science to you.